I didn't expect to see this. We have uh, a re-emergence. The Essential Phone. Do you remember the Essential Phone? Mm -hmm. Uh, I play. I. I mean, how long ago was that? That's a while back now. The Essential Phone. This, of course, was the device made by the former Android guy who then went to work with Google, Andy Rubin. It was this crazy, simple-looking, stripped-down, minimal mm -hmm. Android device. And it came in fancy colors. And at the time, we had seen notches, but nothing close to the type of notch that they put into the original Essential phone. It was the first kind of tiny little water drop. It was, it was a bit mind-blowing at the time. Yeah. We hadn't seen bezel-less. At the time, it just got a lot of attention. On top of that, it was essentially stock Android. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I didn't mean it like that, Will. Yeah, well, I see what you did there. Yeah, you see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Don't give me too much credit. All right. And it had the modules that went on the back, but it never really, I don't know how much steam it picked up from an adoption perspective. I never, anecdotally, I never saw them out in the world, but I thought it was a pretty cool phone of the time. And they went on to sell it for a, a period. I don't know exactly how long as well. It was announced in 2017 and released, released August 17th, 2017. Had a ceramic body, edge-to-edge -edge display. I mean, it was cool at the time. It captured a lot of attention. But then you don't hear from them for a bit. It just kind of, They just kind of go away. You don't hear about them for a bit. In the meantime, smartphones are launching left, right, and center. And then... Today, we get this hot new story, yesterday, we get this uh, this uh, reveal on Andy Rubin's Twitter account of some new thing that he's working on, currently titled Project Gem, which is like a whole new take on a smartphone altogether. It's it's like taking this idea of the, the thin aspect ratio. Mm-hmm type of phone we saw the sony device that did that not to this same degree and and going more extreme with it to, a way of thinking about this is a smartphone chopped in half yeah up and down so slim in the hand based on the images that were shared on ruben's twitter account and a couple of more commercial looking images as well the ui looks to be something unique as well Looking at the front, almost like a watch interface, mm -hmm. because the width is, would be similar to a watch face. Now, they didn't. There's not too much information that's been shared beyond the images. The images kind of make it look like a 360 camera, has a single lens on the back, a little spot for your index finger, a number of colors, and an incredibly slim, trim display on the front. But of course, it is a phone. Yeah, It's running some version of Android, some Android-looking thing on the front. But the theory is currently that the main interface could be voice. Right. It's going to depend more on the Assistant feature. Right. So if you have Google Assistant built in there, and you really start to embrace the idea of interacting mostly through voice, all of a sudden the text-based input and the form factor. Uh, did you notice that this image I, has a yeah. Boston Dynamics robot? I was just going to say. Robot in the back, just chilling? Uh -huh. They got a spot, and we don't even have a spot. I know. That's you rude. got to hit them up again. That's rude. But anyhow, as we move, potentially, I'm just speaking, I'm speculating, but I'm imagining a motivation for a much slimmer device as we move towards potentially more voice-based computing through assistance and so forth maybe the display becomes less important and all of a sudden it's just an info dash now mm -hmm. but you're doing far less text-based entry so you can have a slimmer device granted it doesn't do much for you when it comes to watching video because you're going to have a tiny right. little video window so could this be a companion device to your other device that you watch stuff on and this is more of a tool that you carry with you, a utilitarian kind of play? Who really knows? So we've got uh, some details 
regarding some of the specs. Apparently, it's going to have a Snapdragon 730 processor. There's some leaked code that showed up on XDA developers, which is indicating certain things like the official name possibly remaining the gem. The back little fingerprint looking finger location. There's this, this little divot where you're supposed to rest your index finger. Could be called fingerprint walkie talkie. It could also potentially trigger the assistant. Mm. So that the interface as opposed to necessary. Because, you know, when it comes to using the assistant, the initial headache, at least for me, is around triggering it. Okay, hey, ah, I don't want to say it because I'm going to trigger everybody's uh -huh. thing. Hey, Google, I just did it anyway. Anyway, I apologize for that. Hey, Google, hey, Siri, everybody's triggered now. You see how that works, Very Will? Rude. That's all it takes. I apologize for that. It just, it was too hard not to once we had discussed it. Uh, but there's something uncanny about that moment right there. But the instruction feels a little more natural when you're just when you make might say something like navigate to starbucks mm -hmm. that's for some reason feels much more natural but how do you interact with a device through voice that isn't listening all the time and can't understand context and doesn't know what is a trigger and what isn't and what's an instruction and what isn't mm -hmm. it can't possibly know that so, presumably, the way that Essential plans on tackling that with this very bizarre device is it's a slight touch, a tap to that comfortable index location, which would then initiate the assistant and then therefore allow you to go straight into the instruction without the audible, the audio trigger of hey or okay. Mm -hmm. So that could be a nice, a nice little version of it. That said... The biggest drawback for people is going to remain the fact that this is not going to be an ideal consumption device. Because as much as smartphones are utility devices for people, they help you look at a map, for example, like this in this image, or respond to a text. As much as they do, they, they provide you that functionality, for people, they're increasingly becoming the the main consumption device as seems to be illustrated in the growth of smartphone displays that we've seen occur recently they've gotten huge so i'm not sure as a standalone device i that people are going to go for this the price would have to be right potentially as a companion device an alternative device but maybe not necessarily as a replacement it'll be interesting to see maybe if they have some some really cool killer demos about why you should be interacting mostly through voice. Maybe the case can be made, but in the meantime, it's gonna it's at least gonna get attention because it is so different mm -hmm. because of that very bizarre form factor. Now I notice there's a front facing hole punch camera as well. Otherwise, it's f fairly full of screen. The screen-to-body ratio appears yeah. to be pretty aggressive beyond a hole punch front-facing camera. But none of the information is official yet. All those details that I just mentioned are part of an XDA uh, leak that, that uh, not an XDA leak. Yeah, it was on XDA developers. It was found in the code. Be but Essential themselves hasn't shared that. They've only shared the images. But them sharing the images, it looks like a fairly finished product. Yeah, This thing, it, it would appear to me, is going to be made, certainly. So I'm interested to check it out. I'm always interested in new form factors. But I can see how many users would be skeptical that it could, it could actually replace the smartphone form factor that they're currently enjoying. Nonetheless, it looks cool for the time being. Uh, I've got this report here from PC Mag. Exclusive. iPhone owners not that jazzed about upgrading. So, obviously, we've talked a lot about the iPhone launch releases, 11, 11 Pro, and so forth. And it, it felt to me, just existing in the community and talking to people in public, it, 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 it felt to me as if people were embracing this new phone a little bit more than the last because it, it did represent this, this whole, whole new design. 
as opposed to the 10s, the S version, and so forth. And the camera module and the presentation. I don't know it, the 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 reports we had on the last episode about the increase in production on the standard model 11, the naming convention, the potential marketing benefits of getting rid of the R version. But it turns out, according to this report, this was a survey of, I believe, 600, yeah, 650 current iPhone owners were asked, do you plan on upgrading to any of Apple's new iPhone models? And 82% said, no, I don't plan on upgrading. You had 5% that said, yes, I want to upgrade to the Pro Max. I plan on upgrading to the Pro Max. 3% uh, said 11 Pro. 5% said standard iPhone 11. And 5% said an earlier existing iPhone. But the vast majority said, no, thank you. No need to upgrade. 82%, in fact. So this falls in line with the presumption, based on data and and sentiment in general that people are holding onto their phones longer mm -hmm. we're we saw as we've looked at graphs on premium smartphone sales in general we see this kind of plateau this fatigue that's set in and here is this survey supplying some evidence that that's a real thing apple iphone owners are hanging onto their phones for longer and longer and aren't in interested in this year's super expensive upgrades according to the survey 650 iPhone owners surveyed, 18% they planned on upgrading this year. 61% said they wouldn't pay more than $599 for a new iPhone. And 69% said they expect to hang on to their phone, their next phone, for two years or longer. So a lot of people plan on lower expenditure in the first place and beyond that to hold on to them for a long period of time. This, this is... There's potentially two reasons for this. Obviously, the overall greater economic situation and and what kind of money people have at their disposal, and then also the perceived benefit of upgrading. Mm -hmm. Whether or not these incremental improvements are enough to convince somebody that upgrading is worthwhile. It's It's funny because if you scroll down to the next pie chart, the vast majority of would-be upgraders plan on upgrading to an iPhone 8. 43% of respondents will go from their current iPhone to an iPhone 8 because of the price, oh. even though the iPhone 11 isn't that much more than an iPhone 8. So the iPhone 8 currently 449, the iPhone 11 699. We're talking about 150 bucks difference. So it seems like price is a really big price factor. is serious and right now. It covers now. around 500, 550. It must. It it must now keep in mind this survey the participants had to be a current iPhone user. So this is not the whole smartphone marketplace. This isn't people potentially upgrading to an iPhone who who use a different phone at this moment. It's people who have an iPhone and appear to be fairly satisfied with their iPhone and its feature set, and so much so that they don't see enough of an increase in potential performance or features for the more current version. So they're looking at, say, their iPhone 6 or 7 and say, when I upgrade next, the 8 is good enough for me, mm -hmm. and I'd rather keep the 150 bucks." To me, and I'm sure a lot of other tech heads, that seems insane. Right. We will want the latest, <laughs> I just, you know? I just, not necessarily the pro version, not necessarily the $1,000 version, but the 699 iPhone 11 versus the 450 iPhone 8. But people are okay with their iPhones the way that they are. iPhone owners are okay with their iPhones. Uh -huh. They don't even need notchless designs if they just go with an iPhone 8. And we talked on a recent episode about the iPhone SE 2 that they could potentially launch a $399 iPhone based on the iPhone 8 design. And now you start to understand why. If Apple is extracting similar data to this, then they must know that there is a far, there's a massive market for individuals on iPhone 6s and 7s that are only willing to upgrade if you provide them with something around 400 bucks. And otherwise, they'll just chill. Right. And and that's a that's a new consideration that's something that's something that apple's going to have to grapple with 
the fact that this cost consideration is so significant now, comparative to how it has been in the past, for whatever reason. But given that 37% of people say battery life is their chief complaint about existing iPhones, they should be considering <laughs> the, the newer ones because they have way better battery life, but still, nonetheless. If you scroll down, you get one more cool graph here. How long do you expect to keep your next iPhone? 42% of respondents, the majority of the group say they're gonna, they're gonna keep their next iPhone for more than three years, not up to three years, more than three years. So this whole marketplace is such a different place than it was in the early days of the iPhone with the carrier contracts and the massive subsidies and the ability to go extend your contract for two years and upgrade on that frequency in the new environment where people are footing the bill for the entire cost of the device, they're backing off a lot. And they're also presumably happy with the devices that they're getting, that they can go and then hold on to them. So I'll pose a question to the audience here. All the same questions to you. Do you plan on upgrading your phone anytime soon in the next year? Do you plan on upgrading your phone, yes or no? If so, how much are you willing to spend on your next phone? And the last part of the question, how long do you expect to hold on to that new phone? Hmm. I'm curious about it. Maybe it's a lot like these people. Maybe it's not. These are tech enthusiasts after all. But I'm curious. We have some new information emerging about the upcoming PlayStation 5. Now, of course, we saw that crazy design floating around. Of You know, that design is only going to be for the current developer kit. There's oh, no there's way. Yeah, you know, there's no way it's going to look like that. Well, I know you got all fired up and you, you wanted oh, something that look looked like this. that. I mean, hey. This is a statement right here. And uh, something, <laughs> like this gets you, something like this gets a guy like you going. It's just so different. It gets you all revved up. I'm I'm riled up. Yeah, that's you know? never saw you like that, Will. So a design like that is cool, but it's never going to be the mass market design. It's for the developer kit. Get the developers excited. Give them something that looks like a V12 engine. Get them fired right up. Guy like you, Will. <laughs> yeah. Of course, it gave us some insight because it got the disc drive on there, mm -hmm. a bunch of USB ports, and so forth. It was a, it was an indication, but now we have official stuff confirmed, confirmed updates and so forth. Uh, Sony executives giving us some details, very important details to gamers who are considering upgrading. Uh, some 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 concerns that existed in advance of this release and oh, are always there for next generation consoles. What's going to happen with my old games? Backwards compatibility. Yep. You you may remember the Xbox One debacle on YouTube. People were flipping out. Mm -hmm. All digital. No used games anymore. No backwards. Everyone was stressing over that that version of the Xbox for various reasons. Uh, but so Sony's getting out in front of it and saying, chill, chill, backwards compatibility. Uh, probably the coolest confirmed feature that, that uh, I extracted from this GameSpot article, the SSD storage. Mm. So it's going to ship... Default SSD storage, of course, you've been able to upgrade previous versions of PlayStation, put your own SSD in there. But a lot of people wouldn't because it's an aftermarket kind of thing to do. But by having the SSD in there, you're going to get substantial improvements to your load times, which is one of the, the, the pains in, in gaming. It's mm -hmm. a gaming pain. <laughs> what a weird thing to complain about. Yeah. I got, don't make me wait, but I guess you get this new game... You're all fired up. Guy like you, Will, mm. you can't be waiting for this loading. Yeah. You got to dive right in. You got to jump right in. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, uh, when you have the SSD in there, it's not just load times either. It, it actually improves the performance potentially of the system enough that game developers can approach faster movements and, and, and things within the actual game and cutscenes and so forth. Mm. It just improves the overall performance, just like on your computer right mm -hmm. and SS ssds were a huge upgrade to laptops and the feeling of sna snappiness in general so yeah. you'd assume there'd be a wide variety of improvements to your console also having an ssd they showed off uh some load times in fact there was a it was a spider-man game in fact 
and they per they compared the performance of the PS4 Pro versus the next gen in order to load a particular game. It's a, some next gen Spider-Man game. Which one was it? It was Insomniac Spider-Man. Oh, just the Spider-Man game. I played that game. Remember that, Will? Yeah. I played that game in the... Well, I played it in general, but I played it in the Origin video when we had the computer with all the consoles built mm -hmm. into it. What a wild situation that was. Oh, no, Origin. you played it too. Yeah. Yeah, that game. Great, cool game. I but got my butt kicked from uh, Kingpin. He you, probably, you, probably, you probably deserved it. Yeah, he was, he was tough. Anyhow, uh, that game takes a while to load, and they were able to get the load screen down to less than a second on the PS5 development kit compared to 15 seconds on the PS4 Pro. Uh, so speed is good in this department. Nobody's going to complain about that. Of course, there's other benefits to SSDs, no moving parts, and so mm -hmm. forth. Some other specs, the console will support 8K gameplay. That's pretty wild. Or 4K 120 hertz. Mm. Those are some wild specs from a horsepower perspective. It will also maintain a disk drive. They will not be going diskless, even though, of course, that's always a rumor with any next generation console. Maybe they're just going to move on completely from disks and go all digital. You had the Xbox One S all digital edition, for yeah. example. Um. I think in uh, one of the details, it said that using a disc, you can actually install certain types of um, gameplay onto the SSD. So if you want to choose multiplayer to load faster, you would install only multiplayer and single player and so forth. You know what I mean? Will he do? <laughs> That's what I read. What would we do without you? Yeah. This is I not mean, a show. I, I think uh, load times are really annoying you know like yeah you can just i mean we gotta that, we gotta have you in here plus. for that point of view yeah those little details the little yep yeah, that's yeah. right just keep the thing in check keep it on the rails it's a beautiful thing yeah so anyhow ps5 it's gonna come out in 2020 mm -hmm. so we have the date as well probably in the fall you're guessing fall 2020 you're going to get a, a new playstation a new xbox you're going to get extra horsepower, which is what you're looking for. You're going to get backwards compatibility, which is also what you're going to be looking for. Uh, it's also going to work with PSVR, so you still get the VR stuff going on. It's going to be more energy efficient. The controller yes. is also going to see some pretty cool stuff. They're going to move away from the rumble situation that currently exists and towards haptic feedback, which gives a lot more control over the way yeah. That the vibration feels, uh, the example given here is like crashing into a wall will feel different than gunfire or something like this. Yeah, like holding a bow and like, you know, releasing it is different from like firing a trigger of, you know, a weapon. That's right. Yeah. It's going to have a different type of feel to it. They're calling, they're, they're saying that they're going to have adaptive triggers incorporated into the L2 R2. Developers can program the resistance of the triggers so you feel a tactile sensation. Uh, for accelerating and drawing a bow, and like you said, uh, so it's it's actually both. There's the adaptive triggers, and there's the new haptic rum, uh, in place of rumble technology. So it's gonna have uh, it's gonna have a lot more feel to it. Yeah. We don't have any images uh, yet. I don't know. Has anyone specked up what what they think it might look like? Pro there's probably some spec out there. A DualShock Five. DualShock Five is what it would be called. Do we have any images, any leaks, any renders? That one has a screen in it. Yeah. No, I don't see that happening. Anyway, you know it's going to have the similar inspiration. Oh, there's a leak. What is that leaked? PlayStation 5. Oh, that's the dev kit controller, so it does have a screen in it? Ooh, that could be wild. I don't know. Don't, don't, uh, don't listen to Willie do on this. He might be out to lunch. I don't know. I mean, this is pretty cool man. that one yeah that, that, that's not gonna happen but anyhow the controller is gonna see some improvements lots of improvements coming playstation 5 coming oh they also said it's gonna be it's gonna make the price will make gamers happy uh, considering <laughs> the spe that's all they said they don't just give you a price yeah. they say you're gonna be happy with it <laughs> okay. imagine that you launch a new product they're like what's the price you're going to be happy with it shut up you're happy with it uh but i think what they mean to say is in their opinion Right. Given the hardware you're getting, you know, Will, traditionally, consoles have been lost leaders because they want to sell the software. So they would often, especially for the first version of some of these 
consoles, they would uh, sell them sort of at cost or close to cost. And then they'd get better at making them over time because yep. you could sell them for a profit. I remember hearing this uh, PlayStation 3. They sold at a loss at the launch. Yeah, yeah. if I recall correctly. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't, I don't, I imagine it will be aggressively priced, but I, can I guess 500? I don't know. 500. P people, you put your, you can put your guesses over there. What's your guess, Will? Uh, I would say around 500 as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I already have that guess. So. I'm just looking at the PS4 price at launch. It was 399. Yeah, no, I already guessed 500. But. I would say it's too. It's not too bad. 500. No, no, I already guessed 500. <laughs> so gotta, all right, I heard. You. Yeah, so you got to guess something else. All right, I'm gonna say 499. I'm out of here. Jeez. Microsoft says its Surface Duo phone isn't really a phone. You remember this Surface Duo, Will? Was that too long ago for you? Uh, yeah. Can you remind me what it is? How dare you? <laughs> Surface Duo phone, uh, not scheduled for release immediately, but making waves uh, ever since the Microsoft event where they, they showcased these unusual Surface products. The Duo and the Neo. Neo. So this is the Duo that we're talking about, the smaller of the two, a folding dual screen device with phone functionality. But Microsoft, very reluctant to use the word phone. And there's some speculation as to why that might be the case. What do you think, Will? Why do you think Microsoft wants to stay away from the word phone even though it can make phone calls? I mean, to actually use it as a phone on your head, it's uh, it's a bit strange. You use a phone on your head? <laughs> like this size, I mean. It's a bit ridiculous looking. Even in the commercial, they didn't show uh, the person using it. They right. kind of flipped the camera around, so, mm -hmm. you know, she motioned. So you just think the form factor, it would be too bizarre to call that form factor a phone? Yes, but I'm guessing... There's some other reason. Well, there's a, it's just speculation, of course. They're the ones <laughs> indicating that it shouldn't be called that. You could say, oh, because they want to market the Surface brand and claim right. that this is a Surface, even though it's running Android, and to us it looks mostly like a phone. Uh -huh. It promotes the other service, uh, Surface lineup. If you say, oh, this is part of the Surface family. You like this. You like all this other Surface stuff. If they, if this is the Microsoft, if people call this the Microsoft phone, it puts it somewhere else outside of the ecosystem of their other products. So that's speculation one. Speculation two could be embarrassment over Windows Phone. Windows Phone never took off. Mm -hmm. uh, going to a mobile device running Android is kind of like giving in. Could be perceived. I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. I see Android as a flexible, open operating system why not use it? Widely adopted, well understood. I don't see it that way, but it could be, the perception could exist that, oh, Microsoft phones failed. Why would I want to get a Microsoft phone now? Surface, right. on the other hand, people may have a more positive feeling around that brand because the Surface products appear to be somewhat successful. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be another reason. It could be the reason that you mentioned, that it just doesn't fit into the protocol of the phone. Mm -hmm. It could be, because we're living in a post-phone world. It does seem odd to call any of these things phones at this point. Right. Because most of what people do on them is not phoning things. Phone things. Phony. Yes. Phoners. <laughs> <laughs> When's the last time you had a phone call, Will? A well, real, legit, you dialed the number. I was just thinking, like, FaceTime, iMessage, they're all on all the devices right apple devices so the fact that it's a smartphone an iphone like does it really matter where you answer your phone or you answer the other person so well, it is kind Willie of like do. this post uh device will do kind of thing will so, he do yeah we're living post phone yeah post phone or post malone <laughs> both wow no shout out to post malone he's good he's still he's still relevant you're giving shout outs now I mean, he, he won't listen, but he's What cool. do you mean? You don't know if he listens or not? I went to Coachella. I saw him live. 
It was a great performance. Are you telling the I went to Coachella story again? <laughs> <laughs> Say it every day. Just, uh, you you walk into the office. Hi, I'm Will. I went to Coachella. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very proud of yeah. the Coachella moment that you had. You were a youngster for a weekend. Yep. And now you're an old, now you're old man Will. Yeah. And I'm happy about that, to be honest. I mean, look what I'm wearing. Yeah, I love it. Pretty yeah. old. Yeah. That, you know what they would do if you wore that to Coachella? You're not allowed in. Yeah. Deny yeah. me at the door. Yeah, you're not allowed in. Anyway, exciting times, regardless of what they want to call it. I'm kind of with them. It's a new form factor. Why bother with the whole phone baggage? I get it why pre-existing phones are still phones. And, of course, we use the smart word to kind of imply, well, it's more than a phone. But increasingly, it's kind of strange to, call, to refer to these things as phones when so few people are actually making phone calls. It made a lot of sense in the early days, like, let's say, the original iPhone, when the majority of how you were using that thing and the thing you were replacing was primarily a phone. But these are obviously pocket computers at this point, pocket displays, mobile computing devices although none of those words work very well either what about what do you think about the names duo neo duo well neo though you get the matrix vibe and all that mm -hmm. i don't know yeah i don't know will i <laughs> maybe the surface piece didn't have to be applied to the two smaller models right maybe you don't need to tag everything on maybe it gets confusing What's a surface? I don't... Although, the word surface is so futuristic. Actually, I take that back. I like it. It's just a surface. You see what I'm saying there? Mm -hmm. All your gadgets are just a surface. You make it what it is. It's a surface that can display whatever you please. The surfaces are interchangeable. This is a dual surface device. Surface Duo. Right. Right? You see what I'm saying here? And, and it kind of speaks to their approach to hardware, too, which is get your Surface any way you like. Yeah. You want a Surface that detaches from a keyboard? Get that Surface. You want a Surface that's a book? Get a Surface book. Whatever Surface you want, these are just Surfaces. I think it's kind of cool. Actually, I take it all back. Go for it, Microsoft. All right. Go for the Surface stuff. It's fine. It's futuristic. Samsung closes its last Chinese manufacturing plant as sales plummet. I didn't realize this. Samsung does not manufacture. They're done in China. I was, I guess, maybe I should have known that because I've been looking at enough Samsung devices. It's always made in Vietnam. Hmm. The majority. What's this one? Yeah. Oh, this one's made in Korea. Galaxy Note 10 Plus. My Note 10 Plus here is made in Korea. Oh, okay. But anyway... Often for the premium devices, they're coming from Vietnam, but apparently they were still making some of them in China in their one last remaining facility, which is now set to close. Uh, they abandoned the Chinese market almost completely as well as far as attempting to sell to Chinese people. This story is coming via techspot.com. In 2013, Samsung held the top spot in the Chinese phone market with a volume share of 19%. But last year, they couldn't even grab 1% of the Chinese market well. So they went from 20% of the world's biggest smartphone market, I believe. 20, that's big. 20% of the world's biggest smartphone market in 2013, although it probably wasn't the world's biggest smartphone market in 2013. Nonetheless, a very big market. You go from 20% to less than 1%. Now, of course, we can speculate that the reason for that is how competitive the Chinese manufacturers have become themselves. Brands like Xiaomi, Huawei, uh, Oppo, Vivo, so forth. The various options that exist now that in 2013 were nowhere near as advanced as they are now. They may have existed, but to a lesser degree. Uh, so Samsung, obviously hurt by that or finding it difficult to compete. And then you got the trade war on top of that, which of course applies pressure to various manufacturers to, to, to diversify their production chain. They, they moved pretty much everything at this point to Vietnam, India, uh, in this case with the Note 10 Plus, Korea, uh, they currently employ 200,000 workers in the in the Hanoi area to produce 
nearly 150 million Galaxy devices, those devices destined for East Asian, America, and European markets. So that's pretty wild on its own. 200,000 workers can turn out 150 million Galaxy devices. Wow. Yeah, we're not, we're not very productive, are we? No. How many Galaxy devices have we turned out? Yeah, zero. Negative. Yeah, that's what I thought. So 150 million devices... So their, their main production hub now appears to be in, in Vietnam in that area. Now, despite struggling in the world's two largest markets, that's, that's uh, China and India, where they've been trying in India, as we've documented in the past, to bring in these new product lines to do a better job of com competing with companies like Xiaomi, who are very popular in that region. Uh, but they're still number one overall. Samsung globally, right. still number one accounting for 20.8% of sales across the globe, though that's also down a little bit from 21.7% last year. There's so many players now. Right. Samsung enjoyed a period of time where they were the de facto option in the Android marketplace, where it was just get a Samsung phone if you wanted an, if you didn't want an iPhone, you got a Samsung phone. Mm -hmm. That's not the case now. Now, if you're looking at Samsung phones, I mean, we've seen it firsthand on the channel, if you're looking at Android phones, then you're considering many different brands that in 2013 you might not be considering. Nonetheless, interesting to note that they're kind of backing out of China completely, given the scale of that marketplace. Mm -hmm. That they're just uh, they're moving on, moving along, and closing that facility. So not only are they uh, not only are they kind of moving out of the market from a sales perspective, but also moving out of the market from a employer perspective so interesting development another interesting development apple appears to be uh, getting a little friendlier they're going to start selling microsoft's xbox controller or they they already have mm -hmm. started selling the xbox controller on the apple website now you brought this story to my attention very interesting yeah they're working together what do you have to, what do you think about that well i think it's cool i think it's good i think it's cool um, Apple, uh, I think they created Apple Arcade and, um, you know, if they were to create, um, a controller, I wouldn't be surprised. It's just, at least right now, this is the interim and, uh, Microsoft is, uh, on their site. It's interesting. It's gaming. Interesting. Yeah. Gaming is bringing the mega brands together. Well, in the earlier story... What was it we were talking about where there was a crossover? Oh, with Microsoft and Android. Mm -hmm. Microsoft and Google. They say, okay, we'll make this duo, and we're going to throw Android on there, and it's cool, and we'll be fine with it, and people will benefit. This is another example of that. You have this Apple Arcade product. Many people are already familiar with the Microsoft Xbox controller layout. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a better version engineered right now, who cares? Sell it. Who cares if you didn't make it? Sell it. Make people's lives easier. Right. That said, it's important to note, you can generally get it for less than 60 bucks if you buy it elsewhere. Yeah. So Apple's charging you full pop. <laughs> As they do. Uh, I mean, it's know. just worth mentioning, don't buy it here if you are going to yeah. buy it. Uh, or buy it there because they it's in stock and it's free shipping. Mm -hmm. And it, you can pick it up. So the pickup button being there also implies it may show up in the store. Right. You might see a bigger push for Apple Arcade in general, with accessories aimed at improving your arcade experience, they could have one of those, you know, like a module in the store, mm -hmm. something like this. Now, Apple also published an official video on how to pair an Xbox wireless controller with Apple TV, iPad, iPhone. It also works, works with Mac on the latest operating system, though I hear the latest operating system has some issues, so maybe don't rush to Catalina. upgrade to yeah. Catalina. Uh, but nonetheless, this uh, this controller is going to work natively with those various operating systems. And, of course, that will unlock a better Apple Arcade experience for you exactly. than what you're capable of getting without a controller. And mm -hmm. Apple making the official video, I think, is also significant. They're not just quietly selling it. They're almost encouraging it yeah. at that point. Now, Apple is not listing the Sony controller. If you're a Sony person, a PlayStation user, and you're comfortable with the Sony controller, it also works. It's also supported 
But for whatever reason, Apple ch chose to support, officially support, or sell, not support. They chose to sell the Microsoft controller over the Sony controller for whatever right. reason, but both of them will work. Yes. So you're supported on uh, on either side, regardless of which controller is more comfortable to you. Get out there, kids, and try Apple Arcade. <laughs> I, you don't have to do that. Anyway. Apparently, they have really good games. You're into it? Games. I've I've just read. You didn't stuff. give it a shot yet. I'll no, give it a shot. I'll give it. I'll give it a shot. Yeah. Well, yeah, with the Xbox yeah, controller. I, I don't know. I'll see how it goes. Uh, I got a fun one here, Will. I got a robot that makes 300 pizzas in an hour, because I know it's that time of day. Jack is feeling this right now. 6:28 for us. The hunger starting to go, and just what you need is to see a pizza making robot video where this robot makes 300 fresh pies, Jack, in one hour. And you only need one. Jack, you don't need 300. You need a couple. Okay, so two pizzas for Jack. We play the video here real quick. It's like a conveyor belt. Now, granted, the robot does need a little bit of human assistance. Humans have to feed in some of the ingredients. But Will doesn't know how to load a video on the internet, so What's going on? it really is... Uh, I'm going to have to describe the entire thing here. Yes, please do. Uh, actually, I think if you go to... I have a... If you go to the Twitter handle, Picnic News, at Picnic News, which is the company that makes this, you will see that they're the ones that posted the video that USA Today then went to repost and force you to watch an ad and whatever else. Anyway, they've got uh, a video on here which showcases how the technology works. It all looks very delicious. And it's, I mean, calling it a robot, it's not, it might not be a robot in the sense that you're thinking, it's more of a conveyor thing. It sort of looks like a giant uh, factory almost, like, a, like something that, that you would see in a factory, but it is automated. It does automate the pizza making process from sauce. You know what you need for a pizza, right, Well, Yes. Yeah, you need you gotta have you yeah. gotta have the crust, you gotta have the dough. Then the, after you got the dough, it moves on to the sauce. Mm -hmm. Then after you got the sauce, you go to the cheese. And then after the cheese, you got the other you got the toppings, which could be pepperoni or otherwise. Yeah. You're talking about toppings right now, Jack? I'm I like green pepper. I like pepperoni, green pepper, and Oh man, I, I like it classic too. I don't even necessarily need extra stuff. I like, I like black olives. I like onion on pizza. Man, I don't have a go-to. I think what I like is to mix it up. But that'll give you an idea of where I'm going. Typically, I'm going in that direction. Typically, for my go-to. But anyhow, this—they're not trying to eliminate people completely from the equation. By the way, oh, we will got the video. Will he do? Is I was. This, is this I, the video? I was giving up hope on you for a minute there. I was like, yeah, it's, I, I uh, was. I was thinking it's it was done. Rough. Look at this. Okay, so here we go. The the sauce is going on. The toppings. It's making Jack very hungry. Oh, it's getting cooked, Jack. Now what you gonna do? Look how nice that looks, Jack. <laughs> Jack. Jack doesn't like it. No, it's not uneven. That's very that's very even. Look how even that is. Look at that pizza. You are lying, Jack. You would eat that pizza right now? You know what guy like you would do to a pizza like that right now? Yeah, exactly. Jack's just over there petting his beard right now. You, you know the truth, and Will agrees. Uh, so they're not trying to get rid of pizza people completely, apparently. The goal here with this particular robot is to increase the productivity of the humans that are there. They have a couple of installations at the moment, including Seattle's T-Mobile Park Baseball Stadium, to speed up the pizza-making process. People get fresher pizzas, Will, which is what you would want. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of other places that they're aiming to have it installed, but again, you still got to load it up. The ingredients have to be loaded up by a human. Right. And they're going to run out pretty quick if you're making 300. But the app can send the order straight into the thing. So it's making your pizza the second you know you want it. Is the dough hand tossed? That's yeah. a very important feature. What's wrong with you two? Uh, you guys getting all special and frilly over there. You're hand tossing. You're hand tossing dough now. 
Yeah. And they both say yeah at the same time. So rude. No, I, I don't know. I, I, I would assume so. Yeah, the dough still has to be tossed, obviously. Tossed, rolled. You got to have a little flour on there. And then you put the, the pan with the dough still has to be put into the belt. But at which point the process is then automated from there. I guess you would probably load up the tossed pizza prior. Jack, what do you think happens with the sauce? <laughs> Jack, okay. Boo. Jack's complaining. <laughs> Man, that's just what in, in industrial application looks like, Jack. What do you there's no love? Obviously, it's not love. What do robots know about love, Jack? They don't robots don't know about love. Will? <laughs> it's like uh I don't know. <laughs> Look, <laughs> you guys are crazy. All right, people out there in the world are eating fast food. Where's the love, Jack? What you pizzeria, you wait. You, you, you can go to a pizzeria. I'm not arguing against a fine pizzeria. You can wait. But there's a lot of fast food out there in the world. People, they don't, they want convenience. So you got to appreciate both sides of it. I'll, I'll wait in a pizzeria. All right. Yeah. I never had a problem waiting for a fresh pizza. Yeah. Wood burning. Mm. The right, the, uh, the, 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 the crust is crispy on the outside, soft on the inside. I never had a problem. The sauce? The tomatoes? I never had a problem. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't need cheese in my crust. There's enough cheese on the thing to begin with. All right. Staying in the robot zone, because that's what you would do, although this is not exactly a robot. This is a great story. This is a cool story. It's on Popular Mechanics. Paralyzed man walks in brain-controlled exoskeleton. This is just major cool factor, Will. I don't know if you know what's cool or not, but this is major cool factor. Really? Yeah. All right, I'll note it. So check this guy out. You have a, a legit exoskeleton. He was paralyzed. There was some sort of an accident. He fell off a balcony in a nightclub. And he was paralyzed, I believe, from the neck down, with the exception of a little bit of feeling in, in one of his arms left over, but basically couldn't move at all. And now they, they've given him a brain implant, semi-invasive brain implant. They trained it using his own thoughts, his own uh, signals that would come via your brain into your movements and then map that to a physical exoskeleton that allows him to move around like a human. Huh. Uh, not in a wheelchair. I'm talking legs, arms, and there's a video on here. Where's the video? There's a video of him walking. Oh, maybe that was on YouTube. Maybe you have to go to YouTube to see that. Maybe that's not in this particular article. See if you can find it. There it is. That's the video. It's, it's not perfect. All right, he, it's not moving super quick, and he's in a controlled environment, but he's moving, and that's his brain doing it, Will. Hmm. you got to be impressed by that. Yeah, he's taking, like, no pun intended, the necessary steps. Like, you can see the motion of him stepping, like, one foot forward. This is how they like trained it, with these tiny little movements hitting these dots, even prior to the suit being built, there were little video games in which he would use his mind to train the software mm -hmm. to eventually figure out how the impulse, the thought, should then turn into a, an action. So, let's see here. When training to turn on the brain-powered switch, work began rapidly just two months after surgery, he was successful 73% of the time using the exoskeleton. Our patient already considers his rapidly increasing prosthetic mobility to be rewarding, but his progress has not changed his clinical status. Well, no, of course, not yet. You can see he's hooked up. The, there's a balancing system that hooks him up to the ceiling there so that he can't uh, obviously hurt himself too badly he's still rigged up in this whole thing but w the implications here are massive if all of a sudden you have a person moving via their own thoughts but without having to use their own muscles 
not just for paralyzed people, but also just for humans of the future. Imagine who's going to use their own muscles, Will. Mm -hmm. And this technology is going to get smaller, too. Smaller. You're just, everyone's going to throw their suit on, be super powered. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Of course, in the meantime, it's cool that it's emerging as a potential help for, some, for someone who has lost their mobility. You can imagine that moment, Will, of saying, I'm going to walk, I'm going to move my left leg, and actually moving, having not done it for years, having been paralyzed. That's got to be a real feeling of freedom. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. I love to see stories like this where technology is capable of delivering those experiences that just previously would not be something that could, could be approached at all. A whole body robotic system. Very cool. Uh, speaking of very cool, China has, uh, grew a plant on the moon. That's a pretty wild story. It's never been done before. It marks the first time a plant has ever been grown on the moon. They delivered a number of different species of plants to the moon in order to see if anything would take. And it was actually a cotton plant that sprouted some leaves. How did they get it there? Spaceship, Well, They didn't land. They probably sent a probe, right? Something. Yeah, they put a, yeah, a probe, of course. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, how dare you? <laughs> you, thought, you thought that went under the, flew under the radar? Well, I thought Just like, you had to moon? plant it. Like literally under the soil of the moon. Yeah, they became the first nation to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. The lunar rover carried among its payload a small biosphere that housed six life forms, including cotton seeds. Uh, the problem was it didn't last very long. So that they got the sprout and then it was really cold, as it would be on the dark side of the moon. Yeah, shout out Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> Obviously, people know what I'm talking about there. But nonetheless, they they it showcases maybe the robustness of the cotton plant and the potential future in which we are harvesting the moon. Well, or I don't know, living there. If yeah. you get it heated up, why is it always Mars with with uh, Elon Musk? What what can't we do the moon? Or does he want to do the moon first? It's uh, most habitable. Is that a word, Will? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. It's uh, I like that. the easiest to, I guess. But you know, more than the moon, wouldn't you set up like a it really... It is closer, the moon. Yeah, wouldn't you set up a really cool spot on the moon first and then Mars is next? Maybe that's part of the plan. Yeah. Because he's got his new spaceships and stuff. It's probably part of the plan. Uh, they brought up potato seeds, cotton seeds, yeast, fruit fly eggs, and the common weed. Uh, anyhow, the cotton seed fared the best. And I guess it granted them some degree of insight on the fact that, hey, you, you got some degree, you got some fertility going on up there mm -hmm. on the moon. Now, are you prepared to go to the moon, Will? I would go. You're ready. If there was a return trip? No, no. It's a one-way ticket, mm. brother. You're dead. That's tough. Yeah, you're not going. Yeah. Anyway, plants on the moon. It's a thing. It happened. China did it as well. Kind of interesting. Yeah. They're into the moon. Everyone's in, is space coming back? Do we have a space comeback? Elon's got his space talk. China's interested. You got the big rocket that came out, stainless steel all over, I mean, whatever that. <laughs> it's really shiny. It's so shiny. That's the takeaway. Yeah. Is space cool again? I think so. All right. Yeah. There you go. Well, you said it. If Will said it, then it happens yeah. to be true. All right. Last thing for me, you guys forced me to, this is so, such a difficult, this is tough. Hmm. I mean, it's just difficult, Will. Why is it difficult? Tell me. I don't know, because we talked about the fact that we're going to go see Joker, and we did go see Joker. When was that, yesterday? Yes. We saw Joker yesterday. Took the day off work. Everybody, we just took a day as a team, and we went to see Joker. Yes. And of course you guys were you guys said you got to do you got to talk about it cuz you told the people you're going to go watch it, you got to talk about it. But the problem is first of all we talked about it a lot yesterday. And second of all uh it is tough to condense down into something into a package into a a clip let's say on this show a very complicated movie 
topic, time in the world that gave birth to this movie. It's just so complex. And of course, we we had a there was a tremendous amount of nuance to the conversation yesterday, but a difficult conversation to have in the one-way stream of thought that you're capable of delivering through this camera lens on YouTube. Very difficult thing to talk about. There have been so many hot takes, so many articles written. There's been uh, people that have given their own reviews. IMDb, 9 out of 10, 200,000 reviews. People love it. Critics, not necessarily. A difficult movie about difficult topics. Uh, is it a full spoiler situation? Do I, do I spoil it? Do I talk about anything that happened? Okay, Joker. Joker. Spoiler alert, it's right now. It's a DC movie about a DC character. A character of comic book origin. For the most part, as far as I know, is always... A, a side character is always a villain. There's always a main role occupied by a hero. That doesn't happen in this movie. No. Joker is the hero in this movie. And it's a very difficult thing to come to grips with as a movie goer that you leave unresolved. You leave in the state of evil, in the state of chaos, let's say. You leave in the state, in the mental state of the character Joker. Because it... There is no resolution. Spoiler alert. I'm spoiling everything. I guess if you're watching this clip with the spoiler alert, you already saw it or you don't care to see it. So, right. I mean, how many spoiler alerts can you put in? This is an origin story of Joker, the character. And we know a lot about this character if you're familiar with the Batman stuff that existed before. it. If you saw Dark Knight specifically, you understand this whole chaos order situation the representation, the need for the existence of both Joker and Batman as both sides, as the balance that they need one another. They cover it in that movie and almost every time the Joker appears. In this movie, no balance. The presentation of, of uh, Bruce Wayne, so minimal. Mm -hmm. It's such a minimal presentation, a little child, really insignificant in the scope of the film. This is a film... A huge film, a hundred million dollar plus film where the villain is the hero mm -hmm. in a comic book sense from a comic book origin. It's unprecedented. As far as I know, at this scale, there was a comic book. This was loosely kind of based on the killing game. The that, killing joke. Killing joke. Sorry. The killing joke, which would have been one of those rare cases, I guess, where, where this was... Uh, where a lot, some of the inspiration for this particular movie would have been born. But otherwise, this is a rare occurrence and it's an uneasy thing. It's rare for me, I said this earlier, to see a movie that I really appreciate, a movie that I think is good, a movie that I think is well done, a movie that I think is probably a masterpiece that I don't really like. Do you, see, do you see how conflicting that is? And the reason you don't like it has nothing to do with the movie itself. It has to do with what you think it means or how you think it might be perceived. I think for the wrong person, it could be a dangerous movie to watch. That's a controversial opinion. People say none of this stuff has an effect on anyone. People say uh, video game violence, leave it... Uh, that doesn't make a killer. I don't think it makes a killer either. Uh, but I watch a movie like this and I see the elevation of this particular character and I say to myself, how for the how are you supposed to receive that? This guy was hard done by. He was treated terribly and he wanted to treat other people terribly. And you can imagine, you can you can imagine why that might be the case. Mm -hmm. You can imagine why you would want to act that way. You can imagine why you would want to burn everything down had you found yourself in a similar life position, philosophically. You can understand that point of view. And this movie exists to help you understand that point of view if you can't. To put you in that place. And it does so incredibly effectively. 
If you need a checks and balances system for your life, for your current state of mind, for your position, you can watch something like this and potentially appreciate that more. Right. You can watch something like this and maybe change the way that you treat people. It all depends what you want to take from it, really. It's subjective. But that's that's art, really. Yeah. That's art. I think the difference for me and the reason, if this was an art film and it wasn't positioned as a superhero connection whatsoever and it wasn't the scale that it is, in other words, it wasn't so popular. Kind like an indie flick. If, if it was just an indie flick, I feel like it would be easier to receive it correctly. <laughs> correctly. <laughs> you, it would be easier to... It would be easier to make sense of it. Right. The problem here is it comes in the existence of this comic book world, which typically presents you with balance. This movie has no balance, just chaos. Yeah. It is two hours, two hours and 25, two hours of chaos and two hours and two minutes and the celebration of chaos. Right. Which is an uncomfortable concept. Granted, I understand the purpose. I understand that if we are to feel the mind of an individual like that, a downtrodden, depressed, potentially mentally ill individual, then you're going to, we're going to give you two hours of that. We're not going to give you the resolution because the individual in that, state of the, in that state of mind doesn't get resolution. It's never resolved for them. Mm -hmm. the, the feeling of life for that individual continues like that. When, when he encounters various individuals who he feels have done him wrong, he has one solution for that. Mm -hmm. His resolution becomes there's only one path. There's only one path for his resolution, which is to end the other individual. Mm -hmm. There is no talking. There is no compromise. There is no conversation about potentially changing your ways right. or embracing or understanding where he's coming from. He, his communication method becomes more chaos and more violence. Look, I get it all. I get every single take on it. Do I think, do I think that it should have been made? Absolutely. I think this is a sign of the times. I think it's a thing. I think it's a movie that's about right now. I think it's a I think it's a movie that tries it aims to make sense of some of the craziness that we experience in the news some of the the sentiment around the noise on the internet and the communities that exist and the powerful and those that feel powerless it's very right now this movie but it's also the past Obviously inspired by films like uh, Taxi Driver, which played with these subjects once upon a time. I remember watching that film a bunch of times. Yeah, and this movie was based in the seventies. Yeah. You know, difficult York. topics are going to be difficult to watch, and there's no way around it. There was no way to wrap this one up with a bow tie. And to be honest, I'm happy they didn't. I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad that they attempted to portray it in this accurate fashion. I suppose the message that I'll put out, and I don't, I don't know if anyone else is, is I just hope that people are able to Im imagine the alternative philosophical viewpoint while they're embracing this trip down this chaotic path that you are capable of filling in the missing piece, the balance that would normally exist in this form of narrative. There is no balance here. You must bring the balance when you watch this. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of responsibility for the viewer, and I hope people appreciate that. I hope people take that seriously. It's a serious thing. It's, a it's, a, it's some heavy subject matter. But because of the superhero aspect, I feel like it, it, people are going to interact with it that aren't looking at it with through that degree of severity 
Right. They're just gonna go, it's a, it's Joker, it's the Batman universe, of course I have to see it. Right. But it really, the Batman component, where was Batman? Yeah. They ain't no Batman. It's not even like, it's not even a ba the Batman equivalent on the flip side. Because all Batman movies need the Joker. This Joker movie did not need Batman. Yeah. There needs to be a yin-yang balance. That's what you normally look for. You want to make him the main character. Okay, that's one thing. Look, I'm glad they made it the way they made it. They wanted to give you two hours of chaos. They wanted the average person to experience two hours of chaos, zero resolution. But I'm telling you, that's the way you leave the movie theater. You leave the movie theater chaotic, without resolution, as you should, so that you can better imagine the mindset, the thought process, the potential life experiences, the potential bad roll of the dice that could lead an individual down this chaotic path. Mm -hmm. So that maybe that could alter your, the way that you interact with the world, your own personal philosophy. But I hope people recognize that this isn't it in life. Right. That ain't the way it has to go. That's all. I'm just going to put my own little piece on the end of this to say, I hope that's the way you view it as an individual. That's all. I don't have to tell you how to, you do what you want to do. Yes. Take it how you want to take it. But it doesn't have to go that way. As cool as that was at the end, I mean, this dude on the car, yeah. chaos cheering, cheering for more chaos. It doesn't have to it doesn't have to go that way. It's never too it's never too late. You can you have the ability to change. You can still be a hero. Hmm. You can still be a hero. He could he did You can still be a hero. That's all. I don't know. On that note, though, uh oh, just bring it to a, a lighter side. Joaquin's performance. Oh. Oh. As a movie, as a technical delivery of images and sound. Todd Phillips. Oh my God. I was lost. I was gone for two hours. You can probably tell based on this talk. Yeah. yeah. I don't see a lot of movies, I should also say. People are like, man, why are you being so serious? Like, geez. Chill you don't out. even you go just, to the theater. You just saw a movie. I don't see a lot of movies, so I don't I don't really escape for two hours very often. So that probably added to the impact it had on me. Yeah. Because I just don't get to do it that frequently. And then now I'm back in the theater. And I got you you you, you feed me Joker. You yeah. know? I don't know. I, I hope people don't take this the wrong way. Like that I'm trying to I don't know how people are gonna take even what I said here. I'm I'm saying it's an important movie. It's just uh, a take. Yeah, I'm saying it's an important movie. I'm saying it's really well done. I'm saying it's an important movie. And I, and I and I feel like uh it's it's the most accurate it's a it's an accurate representation of the times of the vibes that's all that's all that's all that's all I can really you wanted me to talk about it it's difficult <laughs> I told you it's complicated it's difficult it's complicated it's yeah. difficult we'll see we'll see what happens next but you told me earlier that uh, he, Phillips was interviewed as to whether or not Batman would make an appearance mm -hmm. in any of his films if he does a follow-up. He said no, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so. a standalone. That oh, was his intention. It's a standalone. Yeah. Okay. So there's no sequel or anything. No. All right. Well, if you if you want if you want to experience two hours of chaos, just to inform yourself, and then you go back to life after this is this is probably well beyond chaos. It's also a you know. Of great movie. I didn't mean it in a negative like, way. I didn't. I don't mean that in a negative no, way. No, no. <laughs> Experience two hours of chaos because it's foreign from your life. Because you should understand right. the depth of it. Because you don't get to have a taste of two hours of chaos in your life. So if you if everything's wrapped up for you and you think it's simple and 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 everything's wonderful, it's just not for everyone. And this movie exists to showcase to to the perfect world that it ain't perfect for everyone. You see what I mean, Will? It's, mm -hmm. it's trying to show you, hey, come into this world for a minute because it is over here.
Not to not to not to justify any actions that he that take place for him in a, in a, in a, in the movie, but the movie exists to show you the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Because I guess I guess it's easy to ignore. Right. Right. The thing starts out with a garbage strike, a garbage strike. Yeah. It's easy to ignore. It's easy to ignore the downtrodden, the people that are that kind of ignored, uh, uh, avoided by society. Okay, that's yeah. a, look. You got me deep in this. You got me deep in this. It's just it's 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 a heavy situation. A anyhow, nonetheless, everyone's going to see it. So yeah. it broke the records for October. Yeah. People are interested. If you saw it, I want to hear what you have to say down in the comments. Obviously. Uh, this is not open and shut. I don't. I'm not trying to to put to put a message out there that's like, like dictating what it means for the record. It's it's art. It's open to interpretation. That's what's cool about it. Uh, I think this one requires some. This one requires some energy from the viewer to really yeah. to really participate to really dig in. So that and maybe that's the message. Dig in, dig in. If you're gonna go for this one, dig in. This one's there's a bit of work in this one. Yeah. On the, from the viewer perspective. I agree. All right. Well, uh, that's. I mean. <laughs> yeah. What do you got? You want you gonna no, start? No. No. Yeah, you do. No. Yeah, you do. I. Uh... You got one more. <laughs> go for it, Will. I'm not trying to sidetrack your final topic. I thought we were gonna end it with the Joker. But, uh, oh, so I was supposed to go to your topic earlier? Okay, save your topic for next time. Yeah. All right, that's a cliffhanger. There you have it. Joker, lots of other stuff. It's heavy. There's a lot going on. Uh, you know, live your life. Yeah. Do what you got to do. Yeah. Do what you got to do.